Good morning. I want to start off by thanking the Digital Pass team for putting together this excellent conference um, and also for welcoming me and inviting me to be a part of it. So today I will give a brief presentation um, regarding biases in technology in the heritage sector and more specifically in museums, databases associated with museums. And I'm gonna do this by exploring two examples situated in Chile, a uh, country in Latin America. Um, the first example regards Surdoc, which is a database containing the objects and artworks of some of Chile's most important museums. The second is related to um, how museums keep track of who visits them each year, their personal characteristics and reasons for visiting. So through a short analysis, we'll open up assumptions about transparency, neutrality, and visibility in technology, and questions of who has the right to be truly seen, counted, and represented in these databases. Um, and most importantly, at the end, we'll also explore more, more nuanced responses to these problems, which are inspired in queer theory, decolonial thought, and indigenous cosmovisions. Um, so although they present themselves as natural, we know by now technologies, digital systems, online databases, even artificial intelligence, carry with them, them our own biases and blind spots. Um, this is something that most of us already know, um, but I guess a couple of examples helps drive the point home, right? Um, so digital technologies such as facial and speech recognition, web searches, and even soap dispensers perform worse for women and people of color than for white males. Um, digital cameras are customized for white faces, um, and audio analysis struggles with breathier and higher pitched voices. Um, Automakers have admitted that their speech recognition doesn't work as well for women and minorities, and they've recommended that women do extensive training and eyesight, um, be taught to speak louder and direct their voices towards the microphone. Um, so in other words, um, technology has inherited our biases based on a perception of a world whose universal subject um, is male, heterosexual, white, and upper white middle class. Um, systems are not colorblind, um, but they rather center white experience, white male experience. Um, so these negative and sometimes unconscious biases determine who we see as a universal consumer or user while marginalizing and rendering invisible others. Um, similar dynamics are at work within museums. Uh, ever since they were created, museums have played a role in defining, shaping, and smoothing out collective identities. Um, it is no coincidence that they were first, um, they first appeared at the same time as nation states, and they played a central role in homogenizing identities and civilizing populations. Uh, their normative and formative powers have been studied by many, um, and it is always important to emphasize how their collections shape an idea of that universal subject and the other, right, in terms of race, class, and gender. So, for example, the museum experience is shaped by a series of explicit and implicit norms, which are meant to give an idea of who belongs there and who doesn't. Um, or if most artworks or specimens, specimens are of a certain gender, they shape our understanding of the centrality and universality of masculinity. Um, likewise, the way in which non-hegemonic cultures are presented signal hierarchies not only of races, but also of epistemologies, cultures, and worldviews, and so on and so forth. Um, so with that in mind, I will analyze the complexities associated with gender data in relation to Chilean museums and the difficulties that lie um, in recognizing and accommodating identities that exist outside of what has been shaped as the norm. Um, the fact is, modern binary understandings of gender continue to compartmentalize and classify into two sanctioned categories, depriving those who do not identify as male or female um, and sexual dissidences of recognition. Um, they've been erased from history, culture, and memory time and time again. And with digital data, it is no different. Um, so although there's plenty of literature on the subject, the first time I was consciously aware of this problem was when I was browsing the collection of artworks owned by the Museum Nacional of Bellas, the National Museum of Visual Arts. Um, I was browsing its collection online, researching the matter of gender representation in art, uh, looking at the ratio of male to female artists and looking at nude portraits specifically. How many of them were by men? How many portrayed female looking bodies? Um, and sort of working along the lines of uh, what the guerrilla girls have done in relation to museums and gallery spaces. 
that I imagine most of you will be familiar with. Um, so although there are official numbers regarding what the museum uh, counts regarding um, the museum's collections, I wanted to get a more personal feel, look at those bodies, their contortions, their expressions, who painted them or photographed them, recorded or created them, and get a sense as to why. Um, so to do so, I, asked, I had to use Surdoc, which is the platform I mentioned earlier. And so I hope you can see my screen now. This is Surdoc. Right, so Surdoc is um, a digital platform created by the Chilean government in order to make um, museums collections more accessible to researchers, researchers and the public. So for example, if I look up city, see that I will have artworks of cities come up. Right. Um, and if I click on any one of them, sorry, the internet's a little bit slow. I will get a fact sheet with different information, um, different categories of information regarding the artwork or object, right? So uh, who created it, its dimensions, its material, uh, registry number, and a short description. Um, so each object in the database has this fact sheet um, with categories that were decided, right? When the government created this. Um, so you can look you can search search through the collection using different filters. So by institution, uh, who created it, right here, different names come up, material. Um, so as you can see, there are no filters for male or female creators. And addition, addition, in addition to the filters, there's search bar, where key terms can be looked up in order to aid search. Um, so interestingly, the search bar doesn't use keywords. Uh, rather, it looks through the, the data sheet of each object and looks for whatever word um, it matches my search with words in the fact sheet. Um, so it, this, is, this makes it really easy to look for words like woman, right, mujer in Spanish, or men. Because any description of woman or man, I mean, every date sheet would probably have the word, right? Associated, even if it's a little bit abstract, it will explain that we're, what we're looking at is man. So what happens if I look for the word lesbiana? No results. What happens if I look for homosexual? No results. So this is weird, right? Um, it's, it was pretty surprising. There are plenty of artworks by lesbian artists, such as Bruna Trufa, Ingrid Wildy, Laura Rodic. There was a um, huge exhibition a couple of years ago um, regarding Laura Rodic as a feminist and lesbian icon. Um, so the lack of recognition of her sexual identity in the description of her artworks is especially shocking. Um, if we look for gay, four artworks will come up, right? So this is by Claudio Gay. It's matching up with the author's name. Then we have two artworks by Pedro Limebel, who was a cross-dresser, um, a very important artist, and somewhat randomly an image of Saint Sebastian, um, who, if we want to know why this picture comes up, the description for some reason mentions that he was a gay icon, that he became a gay icon in the 50s. Um, so these results, results are fairly disturbing when we consider the number, again, of Chilean artists whose sexual orientation played a key role in their work. Um, again, artists who cross-dressed, artists who spoke up against the AIDS pandemic with their art, artists who questioned masculine ideals through the use of nationalist symbols such as the Chilean flag. Um, Pedro Lemebel, Francisco Copello, Las Llegos del Apocalipsi are just some of them. Um, some others are Claudio Bravo, Carlos Lepe, Juan Domingo Davila, all of whom were unabashedly gay and created pointed artworks engaging with their sexuality, engaging with their bodies, with eroticism, with AIDS, um, the conflicted relations 
between these bodies and powerful institutions, dictatorships, the school, and the church. Um, so I interviewed a couple of people who participated in the process of creating Surdoc. And from what I could um, gather, it appears that this oversight does not stem from an intentional operation to erase or minimize the contributions of these artists, but it rather comes from unconscious biases. Um, heterosexual men and women take representation of themselves, of their bodies as granted. Um, as I mentioned, it is hard to describe, almost impossible to describe an artwork where there's the woman without using the word mujer. Um, and the, these interviews also point to the fact that um, there's a very strong, um, the weight of the Catholic Church teachings in Chilean collective identity. So some 70% until recently of the population identified as Catholic. And so that uh, could act as a so, sort of um, self-censorship when approaching terms such as gay, homosexual, lesbian, transsexual, or cross-dresser, right? Even in artworks whose descriptions should evidently have had those words. Um, even the word sex brings up only a handful. I think it's 13 out of 5,000 works. All right. That's it. Um, so what we were thinking, what kind of solutions could we think of here? Um, the most obvious one would be a creation of protocols, right? With strong gender perspective for the writing of descriptions and other information about the artworks um, and protocols that highlighted these problems, unconscious biases, right? And that look to shed light on identities outside of the masculine, um, considering dissident gender identities and sexual pre preferences. But would it really be so easy, right? Um, and at this point, I thought it would be better to look into queer theory. Um, queer theory itself is a rich source from where we can imagine possible solutions. Um, we're so used to binaries and classifications that it is hard to see um, beyond them as solutions, uh, beyond taxonomy, beyond catalogs. Um, but queer theory itself reminds us that, reminds us that those classifications and limits are not rigid, are not unchanging, um, not only when it comes to sex or gender, but also regarding to race, class, even ideas of what art can be, etc. cetera. Um, queerness seeks to subvert, to disrupt, to strain essentialism, essentialisms built on categories that exclude and marginalize by fundamentally defining a group or identity. Um, so if we take queer theory into account, um, we know, um, we can conclude that the images, art objects and artworks that Surdoc contains, just like the creators and authors are not just one thing, right? Um, each one can be described in a multitude of ways from a plurality of perspectives. So instead of the fallback solution of neatly categorizing and differentiating, differentiating we could queer Surdoc by adding ambiguity and insert intersectionality to the search engine. Um, this could be done by replacing orderly categories with constellations of keywords. Um, it could even be done collectively, inviting different groups um, or communities to participate and engage um, with these objects and artworks. Um, so under this approach, each email, image and artwork would not just be this or that, female or male, homosexual, or heterosexual, but coexist within different groups of meaning. Um, so similar, but a little bit different problem came up when I was working with a research team tasked by the Ministry of Culture with creating a new methodology for Chile's annual, annual museum statistics. So in short, each year the government publishes a report um, regarding cultural participation and the state of the museum sector. Um, and in order to gather all necessary data, um, it asks each, each museum to fill out and send in a questionnaire. Um, and this information is then systematized into a single document that accounts for cultural consumption, participation, museum characteristics such as staff composition, race, gender, uh, age, contract type, infrastructure, you know, buildings, conservation area, coffee shop, store, whatever, and visitors, right? Um, their age, their gender, their place of residency, their motives for visiting. Um, so at this point in time, a different set of questions came up, which again um, showcased difficulties associated with including gender identities beyond the male-female binary, um, this time in museum visitors metrics. Um, 
So including them could be done, for example, by adding a third non-binary option um, to the classic male-female question in formulas. Um, or it could be accomplished by the inclusion of, inclusion of a question regarding sexual preferences. Um, but the, we felt this was really uncomfortable. Um, and we were asking ourselves, can governments ask those questions? Um, what happens with privacy or with the delicate processes of coming to terms with one's sexuality, of uh, coming out, transitioning among others? Um, we also wondered which identities should be included and how. Um, would this mean further violence by dealing too roughly or even handedly with intimate processes? And finally, was this information necessary? To what end would it be used? Um, part of this um, project um, was asking researchers and museum professionals and policymakers why they needed certain information, what information was unnecessary. Right, so could these questions be a better fit, for example, in, in the national census? Um, so as in the case of Surdok, it was really interesting when possible solutions started popping up when we included and thought about knowledges and practices that have been not traditionally present in policymaking, uh, institutional or state decision-making. Um, in this case, indigenous and a decolonial theory were particularly helpful. Um, we have scholars such as Silvia Rivera Quiscanqui um, who have used indigenous, indigenous concepts to illuminate new ways of existing the world that go beyond the top-down decisions um, without consultation of those, of those who would be affected and which use a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, so in this regard, the Mapuche word Trawun is especially illuminating. Um, Trawun can, can be roughly trans translated as a grand meeting, an aperture to diverse and inclusive conversation where solutions take shape during the encounter itself. Um, Trawun is collective work. Um, it necessarily entail, entails embodied trust. Um, it, it entails time. It is trust that is born out, out, of, out of spending time and wasting time together. Um, we also consider the word zigzagyar, which um, gives a hint of what these processes might look like. An nonlinear progression without fear of making mistakes or going over things without fear of hesitation or feeling perplexed. It entails flexibility, play, and ambivalence. Um, so if we apply these concepts to our problems, ideas which were not present before can bloom into existence. And so new solutions can be contemplated. Um, for example, if we apply Trawun and Sixagar to this particular problem, um, we immediately thought of asking museums to enter in conversations with their LGBTQ plus communities. Um, so if what we're looking for is whether sexual dissidencies are visiting museums or what, why they do it or why they don't, uh, it would be better to have a conversation with groups who already engage with them, um, where the trust has already been created, um, which would probably yield better and more in-depth answers and trigger productive, intimate, and grounded conversation that goes beyond just numbers and creates affects, trust, and communities with museums. Um, so the way digital systems, we've seen that the way digital systems and databases are coded continue to repeat patterns of violence and um, differences in power in relations to LGBTQIA plus identities. And it is key that we become more and more aware of more and more aware of such embedded biases so as to construct more diverse and inclusive digital technologies. We have seen examples of this in objects and artworks that are cataloged in Surdoc and the way museums characterize their visitors. Um, I have proposed that solutions or improvements to both um, situations and to others, other situations and problems that might come up should not come from tired perspectives or bottom down decisions, but rather we should replace algorithms with situated conversation and interaction. Um, approaches based on queer theory, decoloniality and indigenous worldviews are demanding and they require a change of tech where the state and other institutions make decisions based on the rhythms and um, practices of those it is seeking to understand and integrate and not the other way around. Um, theories and practices that are not usually taken into account can open up new solutions that integrate and visibilize other ways of existing in the world beyond tired, the tired binaries of modernity. Thank you. <laughs>